Well, hello, everybody. Um, we're broadcasting today from Toronto, where it's a beautiful, sunny. You might be able to see behind me the sun coming in uh, from Toronto. It's still quite cold, uh, but the snow's gone. Uh, so uh, we're delighted to here to have Dr. Zucker and Dr. Forrest from Sick Kids Hospital join us for our second webinar. Uh, and this one uh, are, is really focused on high fidelity simulators and their use uh, in surgical training. Uh, so since our first introductory webinar, we're delighted that uh, a large number of you have joined officially our network and, and we're excited by the momentum that that's generating. Uh, as a reminder, the objectives of the Circle of Club Professionals are to facilitate collaboration, communicate the impact, uh, and to support local teams. Uh, we're really focused on implementing comprehensive cleft care. Um, just get started here. There we go. So today, uh, what are we up to? We'll give you a quick update on uh, where we are with the Circle of Cleft Professionals. We'll hear from Dr. Forrest, and then we'll hear from Dr. Zucker, uh, and then we're really excited to have a time of questions and discussion. Uh, so you can participate using the chat feature that's at the bottom of your screen on uh, the Zoom platform, uh, and maybe we'll even hear some people who have experienced this uh, 3D simulator in person. Uh, at the end, we'll review a few technical elements about how to join the discussion forum uh, on a platform called Slack that we're really thrilled about, uh, and then invite you to join our webinar number three, uh, which will happen in May, uh, called Mentoring Online with Dr. Maria Carmen Pamplona. Uh, and definitely today, you'll be wrapped up within uh, 60 minutes. So uh, here, we're before the most people's workday. The UK has lunchtime. Uh, in India, I know we have some people at the end of their workday. We're grateful that you carved out some some time to uh, to participate in this discussion and some learning today. Uh, just a quick update: uh, we've uh, added some more international charity supporters uh, to this this initiative. Uh, Smile Train has just come on board. Uh, we're grateful for Dr. Brian Summerlad and the Cleft Charity that's there, and as 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 well as you know, Project Harar. Deutsche Bleff Kinderhilfe, ABMSS in India, and ECHO, European Cleft Organization, are, are also helping out as we, as we move this forward in, in liaising uh, all, the, all professionals who are committed to comprehensive cleft care in low and middle income countries. Uh, so, why the focus on surgery today? Well, as you see from uh, our applications to the, to the network, uh, that's the largest number of Cleft professionals uh, who are involved in the network so far are in a surgical uh, discipline. Uh, and so that is a key, key uh, issue that people are talking about as we travel the world, uh, followed closely by speech. But uh, as we know, surgery really sets the, uh, sets the agenda and the platform and the, the foundation for effective comprehensive cleft care. Uh, so it only really makes sense to, to start with a focus on, on surgical training. Uh, and some real, really important uh, breakthroughs that are being made uh, in that domain. Uh, as you see, looking at the interests of people who have, who have joined, uh, this particular webinar focuses in on things like innovations in cleft care. It is quite innovative, uh, what has been developed. Uh, research definitely has a connection, uh, and you'll hear a little bit more about that today, and definitely an evidence-informed or evidence-based approach. So if we add those three key interests uh, near the top, you'll see that where it is one of the most uh, important topics that we've heard so far, and, and we're, we're committed to continuing to develop webinar topics that are applicable and really relevant uh, to our partners around the world. So without further ado, uh, we'll pass the, uh, the, the camera and, and the slide deck over uh, to Dr. Christopher Forrest and Dr. Ron Zucker from the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Uh, we've had a, a really productive and uh, exciting partnership uh, as Transforming Faces with uh, the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, and members of that team have been influential within cleft charities uh, around the world. Uh, uh, and so, uh, I'm happy to, to pass the, uh, the mic over to Dr. Chris Forrest uh, to tell us a little bit more about the technical components of power repair and as well as uh, where this 3D simulator has come from. So Dr. Forrest, please. Uh, thank you very much, Hugh. Good morning, everybody. It's um, a pleasure to be part of this. This is a, a very unique opportunity uh, to be able to share with you some of the work that we've been doing around high fidelity surgical simulators. Um, just as a disclosure, I, I am part of the company that makes them. I'm a non-paid consultant and I've been uh, using my expertise in the world of cleft and craniofacial surgery to help uh, develop uh, some of the simulators that uh, I'll show you. 
Um, I certainly don't need to tell you um, that cleft is a huge healthcare burden around the world. Uh, it's the most common congenital defect involving the head and neck with approximately one in 700 births worldwide. And uh, we also recognize the importance of a cleft palate repair before 12 months of age in order to ensure proper speech development, uh, improved uh, nutritional status, and most importantly, I think minimization of the psychosocial impact of having a cleft. And um, you know, the history of cleft goes back uh, to the 1700s. The um, opportunities that come throughout uh, history looking at the way that a cleft palate has re been repaired it's very interesting and essentially, you know, we're still doing the same operation that was done many, many years ago. We've revised it. We now have varying different types of techniques that we use to repair the cleft palate. The furlopalatoplasty has become a very uh, important component of helping correct submucous cleft palates and improving speech. And Brian Summerlad has taught us the importance of the muscle sling in the management of a cleft palate. But all of you who do cleft palate surgery, this picture is a very common scenario. You have a surgeon benched over the mouth, looking down in a very ergonomically uh, challenging position. Um, you see people kind of trying to look in and see what's going on. And um, this is uh, one of the challenges that we have in terms of not just doing cleft palate surgery, uh, but also teaching it. We know that it's a technically uh, a very, very demanding operation in order to get consistently good results. But more importantly, uh, when you have this type of surgery, where well, you can't see the trainee doing uh, the essential parts, it can be very challenging to learn and to teach. And we also know that uh, surgeon experience uh, impacts the patient outcomes in cleft palate surgery. Uh, the more surgery uh, uh, experience that the surgeon has in repairing cleft palates, uh, the better the results in terms of fistula repair and speech. So um, this is one of the uh, incentives behind developing a high fidelity model. And this is a picture of Dale Podolsky. And Dale is a resident in my training program here at the University of Toronto. And uh, he spent three years as part of his training uh, doing a PhD under my supervision. And Dale came to me one day and said, you know, Dr. Forrest, I'm really interested in seeing whether a robot could be used to repair a cleft palate. And I kind of decided that that was a very silly idea, that why would we even think about using robots? And uh, Dale persisted. And he realized that if we were going to use a robot to repair a cleft palate, we couldn't simply take one of the robots and apply it to a clinical situation. There are technical challenges, there are small workspace issues when we're dealing with infants. And so the question of can we use a robot to perform a cleft palate surgery very, very quickly led on to the opportunity of, well, if we're going to use robots, I think we should develop a model for cleft palate surgery, and then we can use the robot on the model. And this is really the genesis of the idea behind developing high-fidelity cleft simulators, both in the world of cleft palate and cleft lip. Dale is an engineer, and I love one of his philosophies is that there's no problem that doesn't have a solution. And so he applied his engineering philosophies to this whole project. And the first thing was he wanted to apply novel technologies and develop new surgical instrumentation. He wanted to see whether a high fidelity cleft palate simulator would be important for learning and teaching. And then finally, um, developing a tool for what we call competency-based education models. So in Canada, we're moving away from an apprentice system for teaching surgery and residency, uh, which is time-based, to developing specific competencies for how our residents and trainees learn particular operations that we teach them. So Dale used a combination of a number of things. He used 3D printing, 3D computer modeling, various polymer techniques, adhesive techniques, material science, industrial design, biomedical communications expertise, and anatomy that was taken from a series of CT scans from patients who had clefts. And we were able to come up with a complex, high-fidelity, life-size cleft palate simulator. And these simulators are pretty realistic in terms of everything from the fascial layers to the presence of the various muscles to vascular pedicles, plus, most importantly, the ability to perform complex surgical procedures and all of the critical steps from the procedure from the beginning to the end. And this is what our simulator looks like. It's a cleft of the secondary palate. There's a cartridge that sits in a base 
You can slide the cartridge in and out. And the kit comes with all of the instrumentation, the sutures, and a dingman. So everything is present in the kit, including a video cable that hooks up to your computer so that you can record your cleft palate surgery. And then we are happy to actually look at the results of the video and score you on that. And this is type of anatomy that we've been able to create. You can see the anterior fibers of the tensor and the palatophoryngeus that we've made an incision along the marginal edge of the clap of, of the palate. Here's the pedicle. Here's the levator tunnel and the levator muscle and the aponeurosis. So you can see that the actual imaging here in our simulator is fairly lifelike. The only thing that you're missing uh, is the blood. And each of the various muscle layers is made out of a different type of silicone, so it has a different feel to it. So the haptic uh, feedback on this model is actually fairly realistic. And here we have the model after we've done the nasal repair, as well as an intravelar veloplasty, and then we'll repair the uh, uh, oral side. Now you can see a small video clip here as we're dissecting. We've got adipose tissue in here, just making sure that the muscle is completely free from the palate. So I would say now we've probably done well over 250 simulator cleft palate repairs uh, around the world using this simulator. And when we rate it for realism and anatomic accuracy, perceived value as a training tool, the ability to transfer knowledge and give confidence in terms of doing the procedure, assess the improvement in technical performance, and also respond to the other variables related to construct validity, create an end product score, and we've also used hand motion analysis to assess the economy of motion using this model. And then finally, I'll show you a little bit at the end as to how we've applied it to robotic surgery, but we're certainly not ready for prime time in this area. And so uh, when we assess them, the cleft palate simulator for realism and anatomic accuracy in these 110 uh, simulations, the scores are very good, 4.12 out of five. The perceived value is even higher, almost 4.9 out of 5. And we also thought that it would be really interesting to determine how often do you actually need to do a cleft palate repair before you get good at it. So we set a series of experiments up where we did a number of consecutive repairs. We had residents, fellows, and experts, such as staff, performing repairs. And we were, in, we were able to get a report on session on the cleft anatomy repair and provide expert feedback. This is an example of one of our residents, Joseph, actually doing that. You can see that this is also connected to the camera and you can see that it's being recorded on a computer screen. So, and then what we can do is we can fast track, uh, fast play the videos. Professors were able to provide a outcome of the uh, cleft palate surgery. Um, we have actually developed what we call the CLOSATS, which is a cleft palate objective structure assessment of technical skill, which is a rating scale that's very much focused on all the very steps of cleft palate surgery. And we're able to use that as a way of assessing outcome following cleft palate surgery. And there's also a, a global rating scale, which is fairly generic in terms of the conclusion that we can also use the simulator. Sorry, one second. Well, actually, if you could please unmute uh, your mute your mic. We hear we're hearing some street scenes from India <laughs> as we go. Sorry, Dr. Forrest. No worries. New technology for everybody. There we go. I think we're back. Yeah. Back in, please. Thanks. Thank you. So um, this, this paper was published in PRS in uh, 2018. And basically it uh, demonstrates that we've been able to uh, assess technical performance and the learning curve in cleft palate surgery uh, using our simulator. And it's not feeding. Oh. I'll just... Sorry, Becca, we're just... Um, Small technical difficulty. There we go. There we go. Back in. I think we could. Yeah. Okay. And Thank so, um, what we're able to do with the close out scale is we actually broke the um, down the actual stages and steps of a cleft palate repair into a number of uh, specific things. So, patient positioning, uh, insertion of the oral retractor or the dingman, assessment of airway pressure if you're going to do a real case, 
we examine the palatal defect, we make markings, and then we start to elevate the mucoperiosteal flap, flaps, we preserve the vasculature pedicle, uh, we assess the oral mucosa, and then we detach the muscle attachments, we dissect the nasal mucosa, identify the levator tunnel, and, and then we close the nasal side, we reapproximate the muscle, and then we have a closure of the oral mucosa and mucoperiosteum. And, and this is a, a way of giving us a opportunity of rating a scale from zero, a one which is poor to five which is good. And then we have kind of a, 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 an overall scale for dissection, very poor being uh, a one and very good being 10. The, for the dissections on the left side, on the right side, an overall rating. And then we're able to come up with a specific score for everybody who's doing this. The global rating scale is a little bit more generic because it talks about things like respect for tissue, time and motion, knowledge of instruments, and it also has validity in cleft palate surgery, but the CLOSATS rating scale is much more appropriate. So you can see here on the left side, this is a novice, a resident who's dissecting off the um, uh, oral uh, mucosa. And then on the opposite side, we have Dr. David Fisher, who's an expert, and you can see that there's a, a big difference in terms of how the, the techniques are carried out. And this is something that lends itself very easily uh, to uh, assessments using the CLOSATS uh, scoring technique. Um, when we uh, looked at the uh, number of independently performed cleft palate repairs, you can see how many we've actually done. You know, these are the, the, the experience of the staff and also the fellows and the residents, and the residents obviously don't have a lot of experience. But what is very interesting to us is if you look at the CLOSATS score on the y-axis, over the number of sessions where we're doing cleft palate surgery, you can see that over a period of time, the score goes up. It goes up with CLOSATS rating scale, and it goes up with a global rating scale. And this is intuitive. You'd think to yourself, the more you do, the better you get. And so um, we're able to actually correlate this in a single resident and develop what we call the, the actual learning curve. And there's a direct relationship between the CLOSATS score and the overall performance score and the global rating scale and the overall performance score. And what's valuable about this is it gives us a minimum pass. So 44 out of 60 using the CLOSATS rating scale, 23 out of 30, if you make that score, then that means that you've developed a level of proficiency in terms of doing the cleft palate surgery. But to me, this is the most interesting thing. How many times does it take you to reach proficiency? So using this type of assessment, on average, it takes about six sessions to reach the minimum standard and 16 sessions to reach the maximum score. So the minimum number of cases you need to do to reach that learning curve minimum is six. And during a residency here at the University of Toronto, that's something that we're trying to uh, achieve using a combination of the model and the, the simulator and also uh, in vivo situations. You can see that when we look at the procedural time for the versus the session number, in actual fact, what's interesting is, is the more that the residents do, the actual slower they get. And we think that this is probably related to the fact that they're becoming much more aware of the anatomy and they're understanding things a lot better. And we also found that there was a difference between the right side and the left side of the cleft because most of our surgeons were right-handed, mm -hmm. making it uh, easier to do surgery on the left. And this was uh, reflected uh, in, uh, in, in the scoring. So in conclusion, I think what we've been able to do is uh, develop um, a high fidelity cleft palate simulator and demonstrate an improvement in technical ability. We've been validate, validating a, a rating scale called CLOSATS, which is very, very transportable and applicable anywhere uh, across the globe. We've created standards for rating scores for proficiency, and we've defined a learning curve in cleft palate surgery. And to date, we've been able to use this sort of model in many, many centers around the world with the idea being to be able to teach cleft palate surgery to those who already have some experience. And you can argue and say, well, if I do this in humans, well, would I need to practice on a simulator? Um, well, it's not, certainly no question that there's nothing that uh, substitute for the real life patient. But we do think that there's a proficiency that comes with using a simulator, especially one that's high fidelity and life size, the combat helped to improve your uh, surgical technical expertise. Very quickly, well, whatever happened to the idea of using a robot? Mm -hmm. So um, we made a, a journey out to the intuitive uh, labs, uh, which are in Sunnyvale, California, 
and we were very fortunate in being able to use a da Vinci robot. And you can see how huge this robot is and how tiny our simulator is at the bottom. And we put it through a, a battery of tests over a period of a weekend. And what we found was that actually, we could actually do uh, surgical robotic repair on our cleft models using the different types of robots. And we analyzed them for a number of things, arm positioning, instrument uh, collisions, and uh, just the way that the instruments actually functioned, the excursion of the instruments, the use of the endoscope, the ideal wrist orientation. Because we think ergonomically using a robot, there may be some significant opportunities of being able to demonstrate and engage people using a robot uh, with this. We were able to uh, successfully complete uh, surgical robotic uh, repair of a cleft simulator with the various types of robots, but there were limitations because of the size of the instrumentation. And so uh, basically we felt that the current instrumentation is probably not ideal. So Dale, being the engineer that he did, came up with his own set of instruments. And this is kind of cool because we were able to come up with a series of instruments that are able to uh, do the, the excursions that we, uh, we're expecting for the um, instrumentation. And you can see here how things are actually functioning. The, um, oh. got it there. Sorry about that. Let me just escape for a second. I'll see if that helps. There we go. Good. Okay, good. And, and you can see this is the surgical uh, uh, arm uh, that attaches to the robot. Here's the instrument at the bottom. This is the size of a dime, so it's fairly small, and it does many of the things. And so using these techniques now, we're able to apply better instrumentation. And certainly in select cases, perhaps using a robot may have some benefit. Um, we do think that there's some opportunities that we will look at in the future, but I don't think that there's any uh, uh, replacement for the standard technique for a cleft palate surgery. Um, we've also developed a cleft lip simulator as well, and I think this is something that has huge uh, opportunity for uh, working on practicing uh, cleft lip repair. This is Dr. Fisher doing one of his repairs uh, using our simulator. And we've also developed uh, other opportunities uh, with other improved instrumentation, and we're also working actually on craniofacial techniques using robots for cutting through bone. So I think at least in Canada, as we move towards a competency-based model of education, uh, the opportunities for simulation are expanding. And we like to think that there's no surgical procedure that can't be simulated, even if it's fairly complex, like a cleft palate surgery. And in our hands, we found that they're safe and effective tools to develop new surgical technologies. This is the Gartner uh, curve for hype uh, for emerging technologies. And you can see that there's different stages. There's the innovation trigger, there's the peak of expected or inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment, the slope of enlightenment, and the plateau of productivity. And there's no question that we're sort of working our way up the slope of the innovation trigger. And we think that we will be able to find our, our happy medium uh, using cleft simulators in the future. One of my colleagues like to say, likes to say that in the plastic surgery, there's sometimes a little bit too much art and not enough science. Michelangelo's favorite medium was marble. Vincent van Gogh liked to paint in oils. John Turner was a proficient watercolorist. Paul Tessier in the world of craniofacial surgery liked to use bone as his medium. And I would say that for the surgeons of the future, the opportunities through 3D printing, maybe surgical robots are things that we should really pay attention to. So this is my email. Uh, please feel free if you have any questions about our simulators or any of the things that I've just talked about this morning, uh, I'd be more than delighted to hear from you. And I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Ron Zucker. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Forrest. Uh, and so, obviously, the rallying cry of the circle of club professionals is application to, to low and middle income country contexts. Uh, and so, our, we're delighted to say that this, the, the team at SickKids Hospital is, is not just excited uh, about the theory of how the, that would work or, or how it works only in contexts like Canada. Uh, but have been starting to pioneer, as you saw from the map earlier, uh, what this looks like in a training context in, in various places around the world. Uh, and so Dr. Ron Zucker from the Hospital for Sick uh, Children, please tell us a little bit more about one application of this, uh, this tool in a training context. Sure, well, <clears throat> first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss this. Uh, this was a great uh, chance to um, engage specific individuals who are going to be doing cleft palate repair 
to have some experience with live surgery and also to transmit this into hands-on simulator uh, practice. So we try to combine these things with specific individuals, live surgery visualization and the simulation and did this at uh, Fundacion Gans in Santiago, Chile. Fundacion Gans is uh, quite a, uh, a wonderful place that has all the facilities that we can use for this particular type of course. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about that in a second, but it has uh, and its own operating room and it has its own multidisciplinary building that encompasses all the different aspects of uh, uh, cleft lip and cleft palate repair. So this course was quite unique in that we selected 12 uh, individuals who were young, interested in cleft palate repair, but importantly had opportunities to do this repair in their home institution. So they would not be limited by resources in their home institution. They'd be able to go back and be able to do this uh, with the support of their hospitals and the equipment necessary to do it. Uh, we had expert teachers. There were three from uh, Chile and uh, three of us from Toronto who were there to oversee these 12 students. We had live surgery taking place in Fundacion Gantz operating uh, theater. And importantly, we had a live feed going into the conference hall uh, where we were able to have a conversation uh, with the surgeons uh, and the students. So there was a direct interaction as the live surgery was going on. And then there was the hands-on simulator a surgery where the students were actually able to uh, carry out the operation under the supervision of the experts. So there were 12 students and uh, six uh, experts. And this was a true partnership between these three organizations, between Sick Kids Hospital uh, in Toronto, between this organization, Transforming Faces, and Fundacion Gantz uh, itself. So to begin, I'd just like to show you a picture of Fundacion Gantz. It's a true comprehensive care facility that looks after cleft children uh, with all aspects of care, be it dentistry, orthodontics, speech, social work, um, hearing, etc. So the whole um, gamut of cleft care professionals is represented in this uh, uh, facility. It had a great operating theater and a very uh, good post-operative care. There was no overnight facilities, but these patients were all done as, as outpatients. So to begin the uh, uh, course, we had uh, a little social get together so that we'd be able to get to know them because it really was going to be a personal interaction between the students and the experts and to get them to know what we were going to do, how we were going to work with them. So we had initially a little get together the next morning. The uh, course began, it was a two day course. Uh, each day had live surgery and each day had uh, the simulated practice with the oversight. We began with some introductory uh, talks on cleft palate repair and uh, how this is carried out and how we are going to be involved with it. And one of the people uh, that was very uh, instrumental was this little chap in the corner who was able to oversee the visual uh, connection between the operating room and the actual conference room that you can see here. Uh, it was a live feed that was absolutely perfect and the visualization of the uh, in, in the operating room was uh, superb. So you can see Dr. Fisher here, he gave an introductory talk on cleft palate anatomy and how we were going to go about repairing it. This is a photo from the uh, conference room on the left-hand side and it can show, and, and on the right-hand side you see the uh, uh, precision of the live surgery being uh, carried out and how excellent the visualization was. And we did this with, um, uh, there was a, uh, a resident who had an endoscope actually, and he held the endoscope at the position in the mouth uh, while the live surgery was being carried out. And in order to make sure that he was getting the right view, the projection of the endoscope was on the wall so he could look at the wall and position the endoscope exactly where he wanted it 
in order to get this feed going into the conference room that was so precise and so excellent. So as a teaching tool, the students really didn't need to go into the operating room. We thought that they might initially in order to see exactly what's going on. But in fact, this feed was so good and was so clear uh, that that was not necessary. On the screen in the uh, conference hall, you can see the uh, the view of the endoscope and the actual surgery being carried out. And then there was an, also in the corner an overview of uh, the operating theater with the surgeons working. So this is what we did initially. There was some discussion as to uh, how the uh, procedure was going to be taken out. And then the uh, students were able to observe the live surgery and importantly have interaction with the uh, surgeons themselves. So the visualization was excellent. You can see the muscle being dissected out uh, here. And this is Dr. Fisher with his loops in the operating theater. So we did two cases, one on each day, and they were personalized cases. And this is a view of the uh, conference hall with the uh, students being able to visualize the surgery and to be able to interact directly with the surgeons. And then after that, we had a discussion of the surgery and a, um, some question and answers as to the specific details of the surgery itself. And then we had the hands-on simulator course. And as Dr. Forrest has pointed out, the simulators are excellent. They come on a base with a cartridge that can go in and out uh, so that the students can use a cartridge and then in fact can replace it using the same uh, base and the same uh, Dingman retractor. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the simulator uh, component. Uh, you can see the students working away with their loops on the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, on the actual simulators. And you can see their computers as well. So it is all recorded. Thanks, yes. It's all recorded so that they can review it afterwards and we can review it with them. And here you can see the uh, experts standing behind the uh, uh, students as well. Uh, monitoring their uh, their operation and we had two uh, students had one expert there was lots of time for discussion which was a good thing we were able to really uh, delve into the details the technical details of cleft palate repair what uh, are the key components and how these key components can be visualized both in live surgery and uh, in the simulator it was a very informal, relaxed atmosphere, so that conversation was easy. And as I said earlier, we had a chance to meet the students beforehand and to get to know them a little bit so that the conversation uh, went very easily, even during the first day of this course. We did a very similar course uh, the second day, again, with, live, with some le uh, talks, uh, some live surgery, discussion of the live surgery, and then uh, another simulation in the afternoon. We had very, very positive feedback about the course. The students were very, uh, very engaged. I must say that these 12 students that we have uh, all were very, very keen and very interested uh, to do this kind of work. And I think that was one of the important parts of this uh, uh, course is to select the students who are going to be doing this very carefully so that they are young, they are keen, and they're also know that they have the opportunity to do this kind of work once they return to their home institution. Uh, they all felt that they were quite prepared after this course to uh, go back to uh, their centers and to do cleft surgery as well uh, on their own. And they felt very well equi equipped at this point in time to teach uh, cleft palate repair to the students that they will be working with. Uh, they were all very uh, thankful, of course, to us and the usual gifts. And then we had a social evening at the end to sort of uh, round it all out. So in general, I felt it was a very, very uh, successful course, uh, combining the aspects of visualization of live surgery and direct communication with the surgeons, and also the ability to use the simulator, as Dr. Forrest has pointed out, in order to gain uh, the technical expertise and the hands-on experience that is so essential. I think we're ready for some questions, Hugh, and we're um, happy to answer any questions that you may have, and thank you very much for your attention and regards from Toronto. Thank you, Dr. Zucker. Um, so we've, uh, Dr. Forrest and Dr. Zucker have walked us through both uh, a long journey, really starting from an idea 
uh, that emerged from uh, a resident and, 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 and his supervisor's kind of, uh, conversation, uh, and then several steps down the road to actually validating this tool, uh, and then all the way to, to having it applied to an organization like Fundacion Gantz that has, uh, as part of its mandate, you know, the desire to train surgeons throughout South America in effective cleft surgery, uh, and especially in countries uh, that might have some of the resource constraints that we don't experience as much here in Toronto. Uh, so this is a great chance now for the 20 or so people who are on this, uh, uh, this, this webinar and also for the folks who will be joining later as this will be recorded and posted. Uh, what are some of the things that, that, that stand out for you uh, that you'd like to ask our experts about around this tool and around its application? And if you'd like to raise your hand or if you'd like to type out uh, in the chat box, then we can, uh, we can read those questions out or you can ask it yourself. Um, to get us started, as people start thinking, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the, the participant selection. So obviously this was a, a you know, high profile conference you know, at a very strong center, uh, but you had a, in mind at Sick Kids Hospital a real desire about who should be part of this, who, who would make the most benefit from, uh, from being part of this workshop. Dr. Zucker, do you have a, any comments on that? Yeah, I think it's critical that the individuals selected uh, are the appropriate individuals that can go on and utilize this training. And we left that to the uh, individuals in South America. Uh, the person who knows most about this was Carlos Giuliano, who sort of uh, was the uh, chairman of this, uh, of, of the course in Santiago. He works at Fundacion Gansi, he has uh, very good connections throughout South America. So he knew the individuals that could be selected that would put this training to the best use. And I think that was critically important to have these young, energetic, very enthusiastic, uh, technically competent people come who can take this training back to their uh, home institution. Thank you, Dr. Zucker. And I must say there were uh, trainees from various parts of South America, from Chile, Argentina, from Peru, from Bolivia, and those people will take it back to their home countries and will be in a position to teach their trainees as well uh, these techniques. So it goes on and on and on, and the, uh, uh, the impact, I think, can be quite, quite, um, quite uh, dramatic, uh, particularly in areas where we know that cleft palate repairs can go awry and can have difficulties and have devastating consequences for the rest of these patients' lives. So it's critically important to do it right the first time. And with this kind of course, we hope that we can train individuals that can do this. So that is, the, is done correctly the first time. But in addition, at SickKids, we have trainees and fellows who come from around the world. Our resident trainees are very interested in learning how to do cleft surgery. And without the opportunity uh, to practice, uh, it's a real challenge to let them um, do the surgery in a, in a baby. And so uh, every year we run uh, workshops using the simulators for their fellows and the residents. And that way they get a, a very, very significant uh, opportunity to uh, enhance their surgical skills by using our simulators so that when they go to the operating room, they're already ahead of the curve. And I think that regardless of whether they decide to do cleft as part of their career, having that experience uh, gives them an awareness that uh, I think is really important uh, for their futures. So uh, it has a, a great opportunity for application. We've also developed simulators for nasal surgery and for ear surgery as well. So uh, we think that we're just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we're, we're, we're finding as good opportunities for uh, uh, exposing our, our trainees uh, two, we have a, I just recently had a chat with uh, somebody who does hand surgery in low and middle income countries and she was saying that it would be great to have a hand contracture model so that they can practice uh, burn scar release. And that's the type of thing that there's no question we, we could help with. So uh, we're very excited about this uh, as, a, as a learning tool. Excellent. So uh, we do have our first question, Dr. Forrest, I think it's more for you, uh, from uh, Dr. Manu Prasad, who's a, a, the surgeon and the head of the cleft unit at St. Joseph's Hospital in Mysore, India. And he'd like you to say more about the idea of how many times a, a, a participant would need to use the survey, uh, use the, the tool to be able to have confidence in, in their results. And, and obviously, you know, you, you did it a lot more with your residents here in University of Toronto, but in some of these other contexts, what are some of your comments on the number of repetitions someone would need? 
so it's 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 interesting, you know, as as surgeons, uh, when we're we're young and we're we're very very flexible in our approach, um, we we may that's when we found that using our residents as our models, it takes on average about six experiences to to become proficient in cleft surgery. And as we get older, I suspect that we become less flexible and we become a, become a little bit more fixed in, in our ideas as to what is the right way and the wrong way. Um, the, the nice thing about this model is that um, using the CLOSAS rating scale, um, anybody can do this. Somebody with the experience of Dr. Zucker or Dr. Fisher can do it, and we can provide a rating score, or somebody who's just starting out can do this. And again, we can provide a, an objective score in terms of how well they've done that surgery. And so I would say that it very much depends on the learner. And having a mind that's open enough to practice using this model, even though you may have been doing cleft surgery uh, in patients for many years, everybody that we've talked to has said, yes, I, I have learned something as a result of doing this. Um, the, 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 the model comes in a, in a set of five. And certainly, I think if, if you look at uh, your individual learning curve, we're all a little bit different. I can tell you in my hands, it took me about three to get to the point where I felt very comfortable. And just as an example, when I used this with the robot, my first surgical repair using a robot and the simulator took me three hours and 10 minutes. And uh, my fourth one took me 45 minutes. So that's, uh, again, another example of proficiency that comes with repetition. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, I see that uh, Jordan Swanson from CHOP slash Operation Smile has a question. Would you like to type it or would you like to, uh, to uh, engage? Can you hear me okay with the uh, microphone? Please go ahead, Jordan. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Forrest, uh, Dr. Zucker. This was a great presentation. And uh, I, uh, uh, with Operation Smile, we were using the simulator last week at a conference in Jordan, and I'll actually be speaking at uh, the ACPA in a session uh, next week using it. So really enthusiastic. I, I, I also really enjoyed hearing Dr. Zucker you speak about the, the implementation in, in, uh, in Chile a few months ago. My question is sort of pulling this information together. Dr. Forrest, you showed that six to nine uses in a simulator seems to be the optimal number. Uh, the amount of time that a trainee is using is increasing actually to maybe two, two and a half hours per run. In a busy two-day session when they're visiting international experts, probably trainees are going to want to spend less time alone practicing because they're going to be wanting to learn. So how do you carry forward from a two-day seminar like that with the simulator? Is it to, to give each trainee six or 12 actual cartridges to work on their own or, or, or sort of how do you put this all together? Great question. Thank you. Dr. Zucker. Oh, thanks. Um, well, I think the critical thing is to have, um, the student understand the principles of what is important in cleft palate repair and how to technically go about this so that they can uh, so that they can do it proficiently. Uh, they in this particular course they had two opportunities to use the simulator under direct supervision and many of them then used the uh, the components as well for other things because the simulator uh, also has a posterior pharynx and it has other things that they can work with. So uh, it has application for other things as well that we are working on and may be able to expand upon. But I think that after this course, they learned enough that they were able to take back this training and felt comfortable enough to go ahead uh, with pallet repairs. And we have a program to assess uh, their competency, if you like, or to assess their results uh, that we are going to uh, uh, work on and about six months after the course is completed. So sometime in the summer, we'll get feedback from them. That's part of the whole deal that they uh, committed themselves to give us feedback on their repairs. So we will be able to assess them and be able to help them further uh, ongoing in their pallet repair surgery. Thanks, Dr. Zucker. I, I don't really have much more to add. Jordan, how did you find the, the, the uh, simulator in, when you were using it in Jordan? What was your impression of it? Yeah, I, I wasn't actually personally in that group, but uh, I think they found it very useful uh, across sort of a spectrum of trainees. And I think one of the pieces that uh, you both talked about is that in addition to the marking, um, to actually feel those deeper tissues, where I think trainees 
can't visualize that as well in just 2D photographs and even videos. And so there's this uncomfortable learning curve for us as faculty when they're actually using the instruments in those more blind and tactile spaces. And I think that that's a real revolutionary part of the simulators, both the lift and the palette. I, I think to me the, the, the key is, is education. And, and Roberto Flores' group just came out with a paper recently demonstrating that when you train somebody, even uh, with a computer simulation, and then you allow them to do a, uh, a simulator surgery, that training beforehand enhances their, their um, outcome, optimizes the results. And, and I think this is something that as, as, as program directors and teachers, we need to pay attention to. And certainly our trainees are looking for it. They, they love the opportunity of being able to practice because that means that they'll get access. And so for us, there's a sort of a nice uh, uh, opportunity here to, to give them the opportunity to learn how to do it, but also to become a little bit more relaxed when they actually do it in, in the real life situation. So uh, for us, it's a win-win situation. Thank you, Dr. Uh, another comment has come up. You, you touched on this in your presentation, uh, but the idea that bleeding control is an important aspect of cleft palate surgery that's difficult to learn in a, in, in a simulator. What are your comments on that observation? We, we thought about introducing some kind of um, component which would be a distraction um, and we, we've not been successful with our simulator in being able to do that. And so that's, that's something I think we'll have to uh, go into the in vivo situation. Uh, so that's, that's just not something that's, that's simple and practical. The, 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 the simulator that we've created is fairly high fidelity and it's very sophisticated in terms of its techniques of applying the um, 3D printing and, and the adhesion. Uh, I think adding uh, bleeding to it um, could be done, but it probably uh, breaks that price point uh, to become uh, making it you know, less accessible to, to the average uh, trainee. Thank you. No, another technical question, Dr. Forrest. Uh, a, a question from uh, Mysore again. Can furloughs procedure be performed using the simulator? Yes, yeah, it's actually, you, know, you can do a von Langenbach, you can do a furlough, you can just do a direct repair, you can do a pharyngeal flap, uh, you can do orthocochia. Um, uh, flaps on this uh, simulator, so it's it's very versatile, and uh, definitely a furlough can be done on this. Uh, future directions. Another question: uh, Where are things at in terms of being able to to rehearse doing a bilateral cleft uh, lip or or unilateral cleft palate? How, how are things progressing in terms of next steps? So ideally, we'd like to have a bank of models with a unilateral, a bilateral, cleft lip, cleft palate, and uh, we're close to developing the bilateral model. So uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you. You touched on this briefly, uh, Dr. Zucker, but um, it was quite phenomenal for me as a non-medical professional to be able to see right inside the lip through the, uh, the video feed that you had from the live surgery. Um, I think for, for many of us who are not surgeons but are quite connected to cleft lip and palate care, that even being in the theater and looking over someone's shoulder is, is very limited in seeing what's going on. Um, can you comment a little bit about the video feature and, and how you've seen that be effective within the, the, the similar model or within the workshop uh, approach? <clears throat> well, it worked, it worked amazingly well, actually. We were quite... Um, concern that it may not be a very clear feed, but uh, the endoscope was uh, superb, and the connections to the screen in the conference room worked flawlessly. And I think what was key is to have an individual be able to hold the endoscope and watch what he was doing on the wall without having to stick his head into the actual surgical field. He could see the end of the endoscope on the wall and position it exactly where he wanted in order to get the uh, uh, vision that he, or, or the, the view that he wanted to get. And um, so that, I, I think that's very important. So the endoscope has to be set up so that it has visualization on the wall, so the person holding it can see exactly where he's uh, at. The surgeon can then work away without anybody else trying to look in the mouth to get the endoscope positioned properly. It had no effect on the actual surgery itself, and the uh, technical aspects of feeding into the conference room uh, were superb. Um, so th those are the technical details that we were concerned about, but I think that uh, they were 
very, very effectively addressed by having this endoscope, particularly by having it on the wall so the holder of the endoscope could see exactly what was going on and that have the feed going into the conference room. And certainly from, from a teaching point of view, the, the kit comes with a cable, a video cable that uh, hooks up by USB. So the nice thing is you can watch a trainee do the surgery by looking at their laptop. Uh, you don't have to peer over their shoulder, potentially intimidate them. And also it's recorded. So we've got a video uh, of their repair uh, that can be stored. And uh, certainly we'd be happy to rate it uh, and score it and send it back. So I think that that feedback loop is something that's very important and uh, that we're, uh, we're continuing to work on. Many of the participants in today's call are surgeons, obviously, as you hear from some of these technical questions, but others are part of the cleft, cleft unit teams. Uh, I wonder if just from each of you, obviously, Sick Kids Hospital has been a pioneer in comprehensive cleft care. How do you see the connection between uh, effective surgeries and the rest of the treatment that a child might need to make a full rehabilitation? <clears throat> well, I think we all recognize that uh, cleft lip and cleft palate uh, are not solely a surgical entity. They require a whole team of people to be able to address all of the various issues. Surgery is a component of that, uh, particularly safe surgery. So anesthesia is critical. The preoperative evaluation to make sure the patients are healthy enough for surgery, as well as the postoperative care. So all of that encompasses sort of the surgical piece, but that's only a part of the whole issue. What we really want to do is to rehabilitate these patients so that they can function normally in society, and that requires a whole bank of people to be able to help them. Social workers, the dental component, be it dent dentition, uh, or people looking after their orthodontics to get the dentition in the right position, which aids not only aesthetically, but also aids in speech and aids in their overall confidence to interact with other people. Speech is a huge, huge component. Uh, speech language pathologists play an enormous role in rehabilitating these children. Uh, even after palate repair, many do require speech therapy in order to get their speech uh, as optimal as possible. Uh, we can't underestimate the importance of hearing and of looking after the hearing issues that are associated with cleft palates. So the social workers that integrate the, the children back into society and also educate the people in the small communities as to what cleft lip and palate is, that it's not something that is a, a curse, but that it's something that just happens and it can be addressed effectively so that we can get these children back into society because that's our goal. Our goal isn't to make a pretty lip. Our goal is to get the patients to function right back in their community where they can feel good about themselves and contribute to their society. I don't think I can top that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Zucker. Uh, we do have someone on the call from Calvo McKenna Hospital in Chile. We had some members of the expert team uh, that were training uh, there. I, I'm, uh, the comment was, surgeons in Chile are very happy with the work done in January with uh, TF and sick kids, surgeons, uh, as well as Dr. Zucker. Uh, I, I'm not sure if there's any other a comment uh, that you can bring in terms of uh, perspective from South America uh, on this training and, and how you see it as part of your, your mandate moving forward. Well, maybe we'll leave, we'll leave it those, at those comments for now, but you're welcome to jump in. Uh, our, our time is winding down. Uh, we, we really want to commit to, to getting, letting everyone get back to their, their regular work. Uh, if there are any other questions, please feel free. This is the time to, to flag it now. Great. Well, that, uh, I think that will conclude uh, this part of our, our input. We, we've got just a few uh, quick updates to, to, to give you around next steps for, for here. And I'll, I'll introduce my colleague, uh, Rebecca Sawyer, uh, who is uh, our special projects coordinator at Transferring Bases, but is also serving a role of coordinating uh, the circle of thought professionals uh, in general. So, uh, Rebecca, what should we know about, uh, about what's happening next? How can our participants on this call uh, continue this conversation and, and continue to be involved in, in this ongoing uh, movement towards comprehensive cleft care in lower middle income countries? For sure. Um, hopefully most of you have been able to get on Slack, which is our um, online um, platform that we're using to have this conversation. 
um, having multiple conversations in all the different disciplines that all of you are involved in. Um, we would love to have you take it over there after we wrap up this morning um, and have a conversation and um, maybe you can ask some more questions there that we can um, talk with each other about. Um, you can also recommend a webinar um, that you would like to see offered um, or one that you yourself might um, like to present. We'd love to hear that. Um, you can also suggest resources for our COCP library um, or a story for our newsletter um, and invite more people to join us um, so that we can keep this conversation going and hear from more people. Um, if you have any questions or if you want to recommend anything like um, we've suggested here, please feel free to email um, us at info at cleftcircle.org. Um, this was just a little Slack overview here. Um, you can look in your uh, um, emails. You, if you have not yet joined Slack, you will have received an invitation and it will take you to something like this where you just need to sign up with your email address um, and then start at our um, welcome thread, which looks like this, and you'll see um, some helpful articles um, that you can use to um, learn more about how uh, Slack works and um, get in on the discussion. An important um, thing is that in, uh, we don't want you to be overwhelmed with the notifications you receive <laughs> once everybody's chatting. Um, so you can always manage your notifications um, as you'll see in this picture here. And you can um, select how often you want to hear from the group, um, which, which threads you want to hear from, um, so that you can stay on top of it, but not be bogged down by a bunch of emails coming into your inbox. Um, yeah. So again, the email is info at cleftcircle.org. If you have any other questions, um, even technical stuff, I'd be happy to help you. Um, feel free to email me at any point. Great. So uh, where do we go from here? Uh, Definitely continue these discussions. Dr. Forrest and Dr. Zucker are both committed to uh, responding. If there's questions that come up, things that have gone along, we've seen even in the chat in the last couple of seconds, uh, some requests, to, uh, some excitement to move forward with this, both from India and from Santiago del Estero in Argentina. Uh, we're continuing to add international charity supporters. Uh, we've just got a big trove of comprehensive cleft care materials from Smile Train uh, that they are keen to highlight through the library. Uh, and we'll tell some of these stories uh, in June with our first newsletter. Uh, mark your calendars now. Uh, our next webinar will be with Dr. Maria Carmen Pamplona uh, about uh, an experience mentoring online, mentoring SLPs uh, online and how that can, can move forward, especially when we're limited by long distances. Uh, and then uh, from India, we're, we're looking forward to uh, hearing from ABMSS about their new uh, found ex uh, embrace of comprehensive cleft care and what that experience has been like in the last 18 months. Uh, so that will come up in June. If you do have any comments or questions, please, uh, Slack is one great place to have that discussion. Otherwise, you can send us an email at info at cleftcircle.org. Thanks so much for your attention today, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.